Good evening, everyone. My name is Iman. I'm a junior here at Georgetown, and I'm an international politics major. I'm also with the Human Rights Club, which is a student organization here at Georgetown. Um, this is the first of our lecture series, and we hope to continue many more in the future. But for today, we have a very distinguished guest, Dr. Ray Giardini, here to join us. Dr. Ray Giardini is an Australian sociologist who has been researching and teaching on migration and human rights in the Middle East for the past 15 years. He was one of the authors of the Qatar Foundation's 2013 Mandatory Standards for Migrant Worker Welfare and is the author of a 2014 report, Migrant Labor Recruitment to Qatar. His talk will focus on what kinds of reform are needed in both origin countries and Qatar to alleviate the systematic uh, violations of human and labor rights. So without further ado, Dr. Ray. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, uh, is this too loud, or is it, is it okay? Okay? Fine, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction. I, I wanted, to, wanted to sort of um, correct the advertising for this lecture, which actually stated on the poster that I was the author of the QF Mandatory Standards, which I was not. I was simply one of a, a wonderful team of people who worked on uh, and um, uh, came up with those standards for the Qatar Foundation. Um, so I needed to clarify that. Uh, today I want to um, talk to you about a number of issues with regard to human rights and migrant labor. Um, much of what I will talk about um, has pertinence not only to Qatar, although I'm focusing on Qatar, but also to the other Gulf states as well with some, with some variations. Um, I will not be able to cover all of the issues, but I'm very, very happy afterwards to, um, to take questions. Uh, and if people find my Australian accent um, a bit troublesome, I'm very happy for you to intervene and ask for clarification if there's something that, I, that I've said that you don't understand. Um, I'm happy for you to do that. Okay, um, I just want to begin with a brief overview of the labor force and foreign labor uh, in the population in Qatar. The, since the 1980s, the whole Gulf region as is really and has been one of the largest migration flows in the world and continues to be. Um, in 2013, approximately 23 million non-nationals uh, um, were in the GCC. Uh, it's probably more than that now. And Qatar has the largest proportion, as, proportion of foreigners in the GCC and probably in the world. It's quite unique, I think, contemporaneously as well as historically. Um, nationals, as of 2013, comprise 9.6% of the population. That was with a population figure of 1.8 million. Um, the figure as um, of the beginning of 2015 is now 2.3 million and rising, so that the proportion of Qatari nationals in the population as a whole is probably even lower. Um, they comprise only around about 6% of the overall workforce. Uh, Qatari males comprise 4% of the total ma male workforce and 1% of the private sector workforce. The male participation rate of Qataris is 70% and the female participation rate 35%. The main industry sectors of the workforce are construction, wholesale retail trades, and household domestic work are the main areas uh, where the majority of people are employed. Uh, public administration is uh, more dominated by Qatari nationals. The nationalities of um, the workforce, and in particular, we don't really know, we don't have official figures. The Qatari government only provides um, a workforce breakdown by nationality in terms of um, Qatari citizens and non-Qatari. But a, a study, a survey that was done on low-income migrants, uh, that's the first column, uh, showed 39% Nepalese, 29% Indian, and so on down the line, um, that was low income. That is, these were um, people with, uh, who had a salary of 1,000 rials or less. Um, 
an, an estimation, a rough estimation of the nationalities, uh, we'll find that there is a more predominance of Indians than Nepalese in the workforce as a whole. Now, there have been many critiques, as you probably are already aware, of um, Qatar since it was awarded the World Cup uh, for 2022. Uh, reports by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, DLA Piper, that was done for the Supreme Committee for the 2022 World Cup, um, the International Labour Organization, the International Trade Union Confederation, uh, UN Special Rapporteur for Migrant Rights, uh, Engineers Against Poverty, the Qatar Foundation itself, with my report on the recruitment process, and also daily newspaper articles around the world. I mean, I receive uh, almost pretty much every day some article about Qatar and uh, claims of slavery and so on. Let me just show you uh, some of the, the, the pages, the front pages of some of these reports. This was the, one of the ILO reports called Tricked and Trapped, um, Amnesty International on Qatar, um, Human Rights Watch, Building a Better World Cup. Funny, I tried to get the exact cover on that uh, yesterday, but I, I, for some reason or other, found the website blocked. Um, this was the DLA Piper uh, report. Uh, and that was my report on recruitment. Uh, yesterday, I also found that this photograph, um, it was taken in Melbourne at the Melbourne Cricket Ground with the, um, uh, the fourth, the quarterfinal for the Cricket World Cup. And um, this Nepalese woman there uh, put, on, put up this poster, which um, was obviously broadcast around the world and went viral on the, on the internet. The security guards took it down immediately. She was detained for about 20 minutes and then she was allowed to return to the cricket. But these kinds of things are happening worldwide, um, which is um, quite damaging. Now, I want to, um, go back there, I wanted just before I go on to the next slide, um, Most of those reports that I've just referred to cover much, much of the same ground about human rights issues and so on. Now, I want to add another dimension to the analysis of what is the system that is actually operating, that it's not just to focus on migrant workers themselves and their conditions of work and, and living here in Qatar, but to work out what is really happening. And I want to go over a number of areas um, and begin with the beginning, which is really about the beginning of the recruitment or need for labor begins with a project that needs to be developed, okay? An idea for a project, and then that project uh, puts out for tenders for corporations or companies to bid to handle those projects. Now, it is important to look at the way in which this operates in order to get an understanding of the beginnings of the demand for labor. So when a project is initiated and bids are called for to tender for a project, it goes through a couple, two, two main phases. There is the pre-qualification stage, which I've um, tried to uh, show you there, where there is a technical evaluation. The technical evaluation looks at all the technical aspects um, of the tender uh, and the specifications. Also, it includes now because we have the mandatory standards in not only in the Qatar Foundation projects, but also with all Q22 projects um, uh, and, and others like QRail. Um, at this point in the technical evaluation, those standards are given to companies 
and they're required to show that they will comply with those standards. The standards cover issues to do with recruitment, with housing, with health and safety, transport, and so on and so forth. And companies are required to sign off on those standards before they can qualify for the next phase, which is the commercial evaluation, when all the prices that, uh, of the project are put forward, or the costs to um, the clients. When that is considered, um, the company or the client will then negotiate the best price. There is still a principle whereby the lowest price, the company that bids the lowest price, will get the, the contract. And I want to say that this is problematic, um, and I think that it, was, it is one of the, maybe one of the reasons why a lot of the um, violations of rights are pressured down, down the track and I hope to uh, identify that for you. So when a company is given the tender uh, at the lowest price, often they'll be squeezed to make it even lower, right, um, for a lower price. And this means that the company that gets the tender uh, will squeeze others down the line, right? These are usually contractors. They're not always companies that will employ workers to do the job, but will subcontract out. And it, something like this. So <clears throat> the contractor may, in fact, do some direct hiring for this project. They will also use subcontractors and manpower supply companies. Manpower supply companies are those companies who will provide them with labor. The labor is already here. They're the ones that house and feed them and pay their wages, and then they hire them out, um, uh, often on a short-term, but sometimes longer-term basis. Now, um, at, at this point, uh, and then you have sub-subcontractors, and you could have sub-sub-subcontractors. And it's, various people argue that at the point where the direct hire and manpower suppliers or at least the direct hire, these, these uh, recruitment of labor for direct hire by the contractors is usually not problematic because these are large corporations. But where the problems lie is with the subcontractors and their subcontractors and possibly also the manpower supply companies. Here is where um, it's argued that at these levels, workers are more vulnerable to violations and uh, corruption. So these companies are going to be forced to reduce their costs as much as possible. And where are they going to re uh, reduce their costs? Well, one area is labor, to reduce the wages of labor and to reduce the recruitment costs of labor. Right? Uh, that's one of the ways and a major way that they can do that. I'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a moment as, as I proceed. One of the things that needs to be mentioned here is that there is no local labor markets operating in Qatar or the GCC states. Because of the kafala system and the inability of workers easily to move from one employer to another, means that there is no uh, real movement. Okay? So that the labor market that is operating here is an international labor market. So that different countries, uh, workers from different countries, will have different wages set for them. And so you get the phenomenon of workers doing the same job but getting different wage, wages based upon their nationality. Now, a lot of external critics who see this operating have often charged Qatar with racism, that there is some kind of racist uh, or discriminatory process going on. I don't think this is the case. It's a factor or a function of the international labor market and of different labor sending or origin, labor origin countries competing with one another to have their nationals uh, go abroad to work and particularly for the remittances uh, which are huge amounts of money 
uh, on an annual basis. So it's important for them, for their national accounts, to maximize the foreign currency earnings through labor mi migrant uh, workers' remittances. Other issues, passports um, is a, an issue that keeps getting raised over and over again. The withholding of passports by employers. Um, now this is strictly against the law, the Qatari law, the Qatar law on sponsorship, uh, Article 9. The sponsor shall deliver the passport or travel document to the sponsored person once the procedures for issuing or renewing the residence permit are accomplished. It's very clear. But the practice still goes on. What we have to determine is the extent to which the withholding of these passports is done on a voluntary basis or is against the wishes of the worker. When we've interviewed both workers and companies who do hold the passport, workers say, well, it's for safekeeping and the companies say it's for safekeeping and that workers can have their passport if they require it or ask for it. One of the problems is that uh, we identified a long time ago that the holding um, of the passport is because workers do not have secure uh, storage space in their accommodation sites. So one of the elements uh, one of the issues that we put into the mandatory standards is that they should have lockable storage space, secure storage space in the accommodation, in which case they can more um, safely um, keep their passports. Um, the government has, in fact, increased the penalties for the violation of this law recently. Exit visas also can be denied. Exit visas are required, as you know, from Qatar and in Saudi Arabia, the only two countries in the Gulf states that have an exit visa requirement. And workers can be stranded if a company goes out of business or the sponsor doesn't make provisions for them. When disputes arise, uh, people can be uh, prevented from leaving the country. And this does happen from time to time. And not always just with low-skilled um, construction workers. NOCs, this, that stands for No Objection Certificate. The No Objection Certificate is required um, by a person who wants to change employers without leaving the country. They need permission from their employer, from their sponsor, to uh, change employers. Um, they're not often given, but there are uh, many cases where, where it is. Now, these elements or uh, issues um, are seen as elements in the restriction of the freedom of movement. Okay? They are seen by many uh, commentators as breaching the rights of freedom of movement, which is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Article 13, namely that, yes, Correct. That's right. Indeed, that's, an, that's another argument. They don't have to, if they, if they have their passports and they're not given an exit visa, they still can't leave the country. Right. Um, but as we'll come to see that the, the exit visa, uh, there has been proposed reforms to that, and I'll come to that in a minute. So, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about the right of freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state, and everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and return to his country. Now, with regard to labor recruitment, which is something that I have spent a lot of time and energy on, workers, before they come to Qatar, often, most often, pay fees and charges to the recruitment agencies in the origin countries. Anything from $400 to $3,000 and, and higher to these recruitment agencies. These are largely people from poor backgrounds and it is a lot of money for them. They often, more than 50%, have to take out loans uh, from family, loans from banks, and loans from what we call loan sharks. And these loans, um, 
study of the world by the World Bank showed that these loans are at usurious interest rates, between 30 and 60 percent interest that these workers are paying, which means that by the time they arrive, they have to work sometimes three, six months a year uh, to pay back those loans before they can begin earning for themselves and their families. Now, usury um, and debt is also against Islamic ethics. Uh, it is a very strong and powerful principle uh, in Islamic ethics, financial ethics, uh, against this. The question is whether that is taken into consideration if it is foreigners, foreign workers, who are in this debt. And I believe that we could put forward an argument to say that there is a responsibility to to make sure that when workers come to Qatar that they arrive debt free, not having paid anything to the recruitment agencies. I'll come uh, I'll talk more about that as we go. Now, it's been argued by a former um, uh, official of the International Labour Organization that these, the money that the workers pay to these recruitment agencies abroad is bribery. And I wanted to change that idea of bribery to extortion. Why? Because the idea of bribery suggests that the worker is bribing the, the recruitment agency when it's not usually the case. It's usually the recruitment agency that is telling the worker, if you want this job, this is how much you have to pay. And that's extortionary. And it's against the labor law in Qatar, Article 33, uh, says the person who is licensed to recruit workers from abroad for others shall be prohibited to receive from the worker any sums representing recruitment fees or expenses or any other costs. And that is absolutely consistent with the ILO Convention 181 on private employment agencies that they should not charge directly or indirectly in whole or in part any fees or costs to workers. So this is pretty clear that what is happening on a vast scale is violating um, both Qatari law and the um, UN uh, conventions. Um, the problem with the Qatar labor law here is that it may be interpreted simply as applying to recruit recruiters here in Qatar and does not apply to recruitment agencies abroad, that is foreign recruitment agencies, because it only has control over its own sovereignty and not in the, um, the labor sending states. Uh, I'm, I want to argue later on that this needs to be rethought, that Qatar and the other GCC states have to take into consideration that recruitment agencies in the sending countries are charging an extortionary uh, huge uh, amounts. Um, now, the fact that workers pay this, uh, this money to the recruitment agencies creates actually a market distortion. That is, that the people who are selected uh, to be employed are those who can and are willing to pay these charges and fees to the recruitment agency, rather than on the basis of merit, that is, their skills, their qualifications, and their experience. And then there's the visa trading. Um, now, the so-called free visas, I'm sure you've all heard of these. It's not free, it's actually free of an employer, right? That's why it's called free. And there are ca many cases where visas are sold on a marketplace. Um, somehow people get, there are various ways in which they might get these visas from companies who have a visa quota, but they don't use that quota, may sell on that visa or give it away, and others can then uh, pass on that visa um, and get paid for it. Okay? This occurs and it's well known. Um, and what unfortunately happens here is that unscrupulous people charge workers a great deal of money for this visa to enter the country, but when they arrive, they have no sponsor, they have no employer, and they have no work. And they get stranded. And this is not just a small amount, there are a lot of, lot of people here, mainly men, who arrive here in that condition. Uh, I'm hearing about 
some men who, in fact, are well-educated, who have been hoodwinked and tricked into coming here with the promise of high wages and secure work, and they're stranded, having paid, in fact, a lot more, between ten and $15,000 for these visas to arrive here. Um, and they live very precarious lives. They cannot leave because they've paid all that money and they're in debt. So they have to find work as best they can, and there are people around who will take day laborers. Uh, you can see around Doha certain places where people come to just try and get work, and trucks come along on a daily basis and pick them up. Um, we also find deception in wage levels. Some workers arrive here and do not get the wage that they were promised. They may not have signed a contract in their home country before arriving, but sign a contract when they arrive or at the airport before they leave. And sometimes even if they've signed a contract in their home country, when they arrive they've given another contract, what's called a substitute contract, which has less conditions and wages than they were promised when they were, uh, before they left. Sometimes companies play around with food allowances, which I find pretty abhorrent. Uh, they may have a wage level, and when they arrive, they're told that, you know, 150 rials or 200 or 300 rials of your wage is actually a food allowance. Now, they weren't told that before they left. Okay? And I find it pretty unconscionable that, that companies play around with these food allowances, which is very small. Imagine trying to live uh, on 150 rials in a month. Uh, it's not possible. And the mandatory standards for QF and others, what we're trying to do is ensure and mandate that companies employing workers must provide them with food, not a food allowance. Because we have had uh, an example of one company we talked to, they decided, they used to give food allowances, but they decided to give the food. Why? Because they found 40 of their workers in hospital because they weren't eating properly, because they didn't have enough, and also they wanted to use their food allowance as their salary to maximize the amount that they could send home to their families. So they weren't eating properly. Uh, right? So this sort of thing can happen. So when workers arrive here, uh, many of those that I've interviewed, uh, I ask them, when you arrived, were you given the salary that you were promised before you left home? No. Oh. Well, did you tell that to your employer when you arrived? Yes, I did. Well, what did your employer say? Well, he said, if I don't like it, I can go home. Now, here, what this tells us is that the company, these are unscrupulous, these are not all companies in Qatar that are doing this, they're mainly the smaller, medium, small-sized companies, the subcontractors that seem to be off the radar doing, uh, um, acting like this. It means that they are arriving and the company knows that they're in debt, right? Knowing that they're in debt, if they tell them to go home, they know they can't go home because they have to pay back that debt. They have to work, they have to receive that salary for a at least a period of time to pay back the loan. So they're trapped. They're trapped in a system whereby they're in debt, that's debt bondage. Uh, they are forced to work maybe in a, uh, in a job that has less money than they wanted or were promised or indeed a, another kind of occupation than they, were, than they thought they were going to get before they came here. That happens. And this all amounts also to human trafficking. If you look at the Palermo Protocol on human trafficking, these, this, this um, scenario actually conforms. That is, people are deceived, they're transported, and they're exploited. These are the three elements that can classify this behavior as human trafficking. And human trafficking, or trafficking in persons, is a, is a transnational crime. And what people don't realize is that this has become normative. Over decades, this practice has been going on, and it's a normal process of recruitment and employment. And yet, it is trafficking. And even worse than the workers paying these exorbitant amounts of money to the recruitment agencies, 
What do the recruitment agencies do? There are thousands and thousands of private recruitment agencies in the sending countries around the world. It's highly competitive. So if a company, let us go back to the tender process, if a company wants to minimize its costs, it can actually make arrangements, and people have been, companies have been doing this for a long time, whereby they don't pay any recruitment costs or charges. In fact, the recruitment agency says, give us the contract to supply the labor, and you don't have to pay anything. We'll pay for the costs. Not only that, we will pay you. Now, what happens here is that the selection of the recruitment agency might be a function of the fact that what we call kickback bribe, kickback bribes are being offered by the recruitment agencies abroad to personnel in the companies that want to uh, hire labor. Now, these may be middle managers uh, rather than senior executives. I think that in many cases, the um, uh, senior executives of the company probably do not know that this is happening at the lower levels. Um, and also, uh, so what that means is that the agency abroad will pay the company to give them the labor supply contract. Uh, if you read my report uh, to QF on this, uh, during my research, I was actually offered a bribe. So, I mean, I, I do have proof of this, and every recruitment agency that I spoke to in all the main five sending countries all said that this is the common practice, and that if they want to stay in business, this is what they have to do. The agent said to me, uh, you know, can you provide, I mean, I tried to tell him that I have no business to, you know, to give you a supply contract, I'm just a researcher. Uh, finally, after a lot of harassment, um, I said, okay, well, what's in it for me? They said, we can't talk on the phone, I'll meet you at a coffee, we'll have coffee and we'll talk about it. And so I did. And he said, well, I said, so if I give you a contract to supply me for 100 workers, what will I get? He said, we'll give you $600 per head. That means that if I gave him a contract for 100 workers, he would give me $60,000 in cash, no paperwork. This is the bribe. That's a lot of money. It's very seductive money. Where does the agent get that money to pay? From the worker. That's the source of these bribes. That's the source of these kickback bribes that are going on. It's the workers that are paying. More than that, when it's been made clear that in many companies when they send personnel over to the labor origin countries to do what we call skills testing or trades testing and the selection of the um, prospective workers, uh, they often require the recruitment agency to pay their hotel bill, to pay their food, and sometimes rather sordid entertainment expenses, uh, for which they will also get receipts and take them back to their companies and claim them when they didn't even pay for them. Who pays for that? The workers. These are the lowest paid workers, these are the low-skilled workers who are the ones who are willing to pay this money and take out loans to, to pay it. But they do not know where the money that they're paying goes to. They do not, they're not aware of this. Right? They're never given receipts for the money that they paid. And that's, a very, very, and that's very, very common. So the corruption there is quite rife and much larger than uh, we may have realized. I've mentioned here outsourced labor suppliers. Here, the manpower, what's called outsourcing manpower suppliers that provide the labor who are already here. Um, many companies use them instead of directly hiring workers. It means that they just have to have a contract with that company rather than employ people directly. But they often do not check the way in which these workers were recruited, and they may have been trafficked. Right? So there needs to be more oversight uh, and vigilance with regard to, to those kinds of companies. Um, the main worker complaints 
uh, are underpayment, non-payment, and delayed payment of wages. The, that, that's crucial, and it tells us that the main interest of workers is indeed their wages, to maximise their earnings, at least to get what they were promised, and to get it on time. And you know, uh, uh, in, in Islam, the Quran makes it very, very clear that a worker should be paid before the sweat on his brow dries. That's a very short period. And so, uh, what we have now is a um, change in the law to make sure that companies pay workers into a bank account through bank transfer so that there can be an official record of how much they've paid and when they were paid. And I think this is a, a very positive um, reform. Um, I've talked to you about the food allowances already. Uh, sometimes workers actually uh, have their wages deducted for recruitment fees against the law. Uh, sometimes visa costs also. I mean, I have here, for example, I couldn't get it onto the PowerPoint. I'm sorry, I tried. My technical skills are not great. Um, but I have here, uh, you know, a copy of a contract for a worker where the contract says that uh, the person will get 1,100 rials as a wage and 300 uh, rials uh, for a food allowance. Okay, that's the contract. Um, the pay slip says something different. The pay slip actually says, yes, the 1,100 uh, dollar uh, um, rial wage, but the food allowance is only 200. And on top of that, there is, it states that recruitment charges 100 rials per month is being taken out. Workers simply have to accept these things. They cannot complain, because if they complain, they fear that they might lose their jobs. So it's very easy for a small company. This is a, this is a small subsidiary company of a, of a much larger company. The, the executive who signed the contract, I'm absolutely certain, has no idea down the chain that this is occurring, that this person is not getting what is actually written in the contract itself. So this is just one, uh, one example. Um, and it's very rare to actually get this kind of documentation because it is clearly a breach. It's a violation of the law. Okay? Now, given all of that, uh, a question that we might enter into discussion about afterwards, who is responsible for these violations? Who do we, who do we target is it the system? Of, is it just the business system? Everybody trying to uh, get the contract, minimize the costs uh, all around? Is it the Qatar government? Is it the sponsors? Is it the governments in the origin countries? Because the governments in the labor origin countries actually allow that workers pay these recruitment fees to the recruitment agencies between one month and two months salary. And that opens the gate for these recruitment agents to actually charge them a heck of a lot more and without any transparency or oversight or regulation. Um, is it the rec so is it the recruitment agencies? Are they, is it the expat, I mean, th these middle managers are usually non qataris They're Sri Lankans and Filipinas and Lebanese and Palestinians and Egyptians and a whole range of uh, Asians and, and, and Arabs who are engaged in this at the operational level. So you might want to think, think about that. Now, just very, very briefly, I'm not going to go into any details, but just to show you that Qatar has ratified a number of international labor organization conventions. It is a member of the International Labor Organization, um, Convention on Forced Labor, and, and so on. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through them all. These are the ILO conventions that have not been ratified, but which the ILO has been pressuring the government to ratify. Um, which includes the Convention Concerning Decent Work for Domestic Workers.
Qatar has ratified uh, a number of the major UN, United Nations conventions, um, including the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, on Torture, and on transnational organized crime, including the Palermo Protocol um, against trafficking in persons, and has enacted local legislation, anti-trafficking legislation, and indeed set up an anti-trafficking unit. Um, conventions that are not ratified by Qatar, um, importantly, is the, the 1990 convention. It was enacted in 1990, but only came into force in 2003. It took a long time. There are only 47 um, uh, ratifications of this convention. It is a very big convention. It has become, it's argued that it's so comprehensive that it's not workable, and many countries will not sign this convention. The main countries that have signed this convention are labor sending countries rather than labor receiving countries. Um, there are, I think, five Arab states that have signed it. Egypt was the first to sign it, but then Egypt has usually been the first to sign every UN convention, <laughs> right? Um, so Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Algeria, and Mauritania have signed uh, this, this convention. But it's very powerful because it also includes uh, irregular or undocumented workers, arguing that they also have rights, even though they may be in the country illegally. OK, to get on to reform, um, well, you're all aware of the Qatar Foundation Mandatory Standards for Migrant Worker Welfare for the contractors and subcontractors, which was then adopted uh, and slightly but not a great deal modified by the Supreme Committee for uh, the 2022 World Cup. Um, it has also been adopted by QRail and other organizations as the standards for all the projects which they are tendering out for. Um, there has been a lot of work in this area, and it's ongoing, and it's very, very slow in many ways, but there are these standards. These standards were brought in at a commercial level, not at a legislative level. Okay? These are focusing on the commerce, the relationships between uh, corporations and their suppliers and uh, sub-suppliers. Uh, that is quite a broad range. I'm not going to talk about housing, but included in these standards are standards for housing and the labor camps and so on. There are reforms going on in that area that are not being adequately recognized, and they're, and they're widespread. Um, I wanted to mention the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. American companies that are, have supply chains all around the world have to uh, um, be careful about their suppliers down, uh, down the line because they will be liable for prosecution uh, if it is found that there is trafficking uh, in their subcontractors they don't know about. And that, that law may, uh, also requires them to make sure, that is to be proactive, that nothing is happening, to put in measures for evaluations and assessments that it is not happening down their supply chain. And the UK Bribery Act is very similar, only broad, broader with regard to, whereas the, uh, the US, um, US legislation really only refers to bribery of, of government officials. So it's fairly limited in that sense. But where there's visa trading, that may be able to be uh, argued. Um, Labor supply evaluations, there are many companies who do this as a profession. Uh, perhaps one of the most uh, uh, competent um, and most successful is actually an uh, organization called Verite, which actually is a non-profit organization that has been working in Qatar with the government and with Q22 and others to help to do the evaluations of these supply chains to make sure that there's no corruption um, and that's operating and to try and bring about greater transparency in all the operations uh, that I've been talking about. Because, you know, there's a lot of pressure on companies and on company personnel to get the project done and to get it done quickly. There are time pressures. And often, because of those pressures, it means that companies are not vigilant enough 
uh, down the chain to make sure that there are no violations of human rights and labour rights down the supply chain. So it requires others to do this. Um, the legislative reform that the Qatar government has promised um, has a number of uh, elements to it. Firstly, uh, they, there have been a number of statements, particularly last year and in the United Nations, that the kafala system will change, that it will no longer be uh, the sponsor, will no longer be in private hands, but rather the state will take on the role of sponsorship, and the system will be more based upon contracts, contracts between employers and employees. Now, I'm not quite sure what that means because there are already contracts. Uh, it might mean that it's a more standardized contract. I don't know. Um, but this is a big issue, um, and to reform the kafala system in such a whole-scale way, um, I think may be proving difficult. We can talk about that later on. Um, wages paid by bank transfer, as I've mentioned. Exit visas uh, will be um, uh, not required, but whenever a person wants to leave the country, they need to give 72 hours of the intention to leave the country. That gives the employer 72 hours to make uh, a travel ban, for example, because there might be some kind of discrepancy or some kind of problem. Um, and then that will need to have some kind of judicial review um, to find out what the problem is and may be able to be resolved in a quick uh, period of time. NOCs, uh, the non-objection certificates uh, will, will not be required when a person has completed the term of their contract. So if you have a contract for one or two years, when that, con when that period is finished, you can change employers without permission of your existing employer. If you have a contract that is indeterminate, then that will be five years, which might apply more to expats uh, than, uh, than workers. Uh, Bahrain abolished NOCs in 2009 in entirely but in fact they changed their minds in 2011. They mandated that a person has to stay with their employer for one year minimum and then can change employers. Um, I want to argue that uh, other reform is also required, that what's required, I think, is bilateral or multilateral agreements between governments of receiving countries and governments of sending countries. If, for example, if the Qatar government was to say to the Bangladesh government, we want you to supply us with labor, but we want to make sure that your workers do not pay any recruitment fees or charges. This is mandated in the mandatory standards, and it's in the labor law. So it would not seem to me to be a big jump to require that of those governments. In fact, I believe that pressure should be given onto the governments of the origin countries to abolish, to ban the payment, any payment, by workers to the recruitment agencies in their country. Once that is done, and if that is done, all workers will know that they do not have to pay anything. Because there is a culture of these workers in those countries of paying money. They expect to pay money to get these jobs. It's been happening for decades. In fact, it goes so far that workers, if, a, if an agency, for example, says to a prospective worker, you don't have to pay us anything, they probably won't trust that agent because they believe they have to pay something. In fact, they'll probably go to the agent who charges the most because they think that they're going to be more guaranteed a better job and guaranteed that job by an agent that charges the most. That culture needs to change, and that's in the, in the uh, origin countries. And, and I think that these bilateral arrangements, even government to government um, uh, recruitment itself, there are in some countries government recruitment agencies that can be used uh, that do not charge or charge very, very, very little. And greater transparency all around needs to be developed. In the tendering process, for example, the labor costs are not detailed. They're not asked for. 
and not expected to be given. So the, um, the client does not know whether the, whether the company intends to be paying recruitment charges or not. And they may save on that in order to get the lowest bid. So there needs to be greater transparency and greater or increased labor ministry inspections and prosecutions for these violations, I think, um, are required. Um, so with that, I think I've, <clears throat> I've taxed you long enough. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.